Hi, it's Robert Mitchell, and I'm here at the 2016 Enlight Human Rights Film Festival here in Bloomington, Indiana. And sitting beside me is a Pulitzer Prize winning political cartoonist, Joel Pett, who is, uh, he was actually born in Bloomington. Bloomington native. Um, I guess, uh, so, which would lead me to my first question. Um, you were born here, and then you went to uh, Africa with your father, who was a professor, who was uh, teaching here? Yeah, my family moved overseas when I was uh, six, and at that point, you don't really have the autonomy to go, you know, I don't think so. Africa, no, I think I'll just hang with Bloomington. So, uh, you know, me and my siblings, we went along for the ride. How did uh, those early experiences of being outside of America form you uh, in your um, formative years? You know, that's a good question. Of course, you don't know because it's the only experience you ever have. But uh, I like to think that it it sort of uh, made me view this country through the eyes of an outsider. Like I've never really felt like I fit in here very well. Not that I would fit in in Nigeria these days either. Um, but it was actually a lovely little window in history to be in not just Nigeria but any part of Africa because early 1960s, right after everybody had uh, independence from whatever colonial power uh, was there, a uh, lot of optimism and uh, you know forward thinking, and it was it was terrific. Really, kind of a great place to uh, to grow up. Uh, although I wouldn't go near it now. I'm, a, you know. It's, it's unfortunate uh, the continent has, uh, has had an awful lot of trouble, in Nigeria especially. Well, and some of that is probably directly tied to American uh, foreign influence. Well, maybe. It's hard to know. Um, you know, once there's a colonial power and then they're um, removed, if things go to hell, you don't know who to blame. It's just like the people are now saying, yeah, we should have left Saddam Hussein in Iraq. It couldn't be any worse, uh, which there may be some kind of truth to it, but it's a difficult truth to swallow, especially if you, yours is the, the country that's being, uh, that's under the uh, yoke of oppression, if you, if you will. And um, when did you start, uh, when did you first pick up uh, a pen or a pencil and start drawing? Well, you know, everybody picks up pens and pencils and starts drawing when they're little kids, but most people quit eventually. Uh, there's something about uh, the creativity of a youngster that's like so great. You know, if you ask any six-year-old, can you draw? They're like, yeah, watch me. Can you sing? Yeah, listen to me. Can you dance? Yeah. And by the time they're 12, they're like, no, I'm no good. <laughs> uh, but I fell in love with political cartoons during the Vietnam War when I just saw them in newspapers. Um, thank God my parents had newspapers around the house. Um, and I just thought they were really cool. And I mean, I wasn't, you know, savvy enough to realize it was a really difficult thing uh, to do, and even a harder thing to get a job doing. Um, it's kind of fortunate that you're so naive when you're young. You just go, "Yeah, that's what I'm going to be." And you know, through an awful lot of uh, a certain amount of perseverance, but a huge amount of just flat out bald good luck, I've had I've had a really uh, nice career. Uh, knock wood so far from it. You've, uh, as a political cartoonist, you've covered a lot of election cycles, uh, local, state, federal. Here we are in the midst of this 2016 presidential campaign, and I have to ask you, so what is your uh, take on how this is uh, unfolding thus far? Well, first of all, it's a funny thing about political campaigns. People think it's a heyday for cartoonists and comedians, which in some ways it is. But it's also a major distraction. Um, you can get to the end of an election year and realize that you drew, you know, what's in my normal work year is 250 of them. And you maybe spend 100 of them on, you know, sort of horse race things that seemed really important on that day and had a shelf life of two days. And you didn't do anything about uh, world hunger or not educating girls or global warming or, uh, you know what I mean? And it just seems like, you, you know, you get, it's easy to get caught up in that 24-7 news cycle where you think, oh, my God, Jeb Bush dropped out. i, I got to say something about this when really how much news is that? Everybody knows it. It's just not that important. So it's a two-edged sword. It does make it easy. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. You get a guy like Donald Trump. Um, now, now that he's a serious threat, I actually don't think Trump cartoons are wasted because it's kind of important for people to have him revealed for what he is, not that they're uh, paying any attention. Um, but, yeah, it, it is, uh, you know, a caucus is pretty close to a circus. <laughs> this is what they had in Kentucky today. 
Well, uh, presidential uh, election is obviously very important, but as you were saying, there's stuff that's happening every day that just kind of just gets swept off the front pages and people aren't talking about it because, oh, Trump said this outrageous thing today. Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's not just election years. You know, it's a to some degree a function of the of the cable news cycle. You know, it needs to be fed that monster every half an hour and they're going to find something to feed it. And of course, the, you know, their game is we need eyeballs or, you know, clicks on the website or whatever. So we need stuff that people want to see. Well, who wants to see news about refugees? You know, nobody. Who wants to see any kind of really horrible bad news? Nobody. So it's uh, it's difficult, but, you know, I'm not an editor or a publisher. It's not my job to try to figure out how to make, you know, the industry work. But it is disconcerting, especially in print media, to watch the... Uh, you know, the business model, uh, I, I don't think collapse is too strong a word. Um, it, it's a difficult time. And uh, you've um, obviously been in this newspaper game a very long time. And as you were saying, editors and that, did you ever uh, draw something that you felt personally was over the line or an editor said, man, maybe we shouldn't run that today? Well, it so happens you're asking that on a very interesting day. Uh, in my 32 years, I've had only about four of them killed but three of them have been in the last few months. So I am uh, at loggerheads at the moment with my uh, current uh, publisher, who's a terrific nice guy, but we have completely different politics. And in some ways, if he's offended by the stuff that I do, you know, he's kind of part of my target audience. Um, and he sees his job uh, differently than, you know, the other people uh, who have come before him. And, uh, I made a mistake last week. Uh, he pulled something and I tweeted out. I tweeted the cartoon and said, I mean, I didn't call him any names or anything. I just said, yeah, my publisher pulled this, um, uh, which, you know, is kind of uh, perceived as a slight to his uh, authority, which, of course, it is. Um, and so I probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, but for the most part, I've had really good luck and a lot of uh, good editors and publishers. It's kind of a bitter pill for a newspaper publisher to realize that the cartoonist thinks their job is just to defend us, not to, not to uh, you know, filter our work through their sensibilities or try to protect the public from something that's, you know, quote, over the line. The only couple times when I've ever really felt like I did something I shouldn't was when I maybe landed with a you know, you can really, this is a real sledgehammer sometimes. You can really, like, you know, lower the boom on people, which if it's a presidential candidate or a national politician, that doesn't matter. But I do it to city councilmen and stuff sometimes when I think they deserve it. And on one or two occasions, I wish I'd have been more clever and a little less mean mm -hmm. to a couple of these people who are, after all, you know, the the, community. they're in the community and they're public servants. It's not like they're getting rich or anything uh, so, you know, that's uh, that's the, those are the ones that that pop to mind. But for the most part, I don't I don't have a lot of regrets. I just do it again the next day. And over the years, um, being based in Kentucky, uh, one of the organizations you are uh, vigilant about going after is Kentucky basketball. Yeah, and uh, um, that leads me to my question about hate mail, and I'm sure you've gotten your. Uh, fair share over the years as a human being how do you deal with that because nobody really wants to be like well this person doesn't like me or right. maybe it escalates uh well back when it was real mail um and it took some effort to send it i answered it all mm -hmm. um and i called people back if they left a phone message i called them even if it was you know just some foul uh uh, uh, condemnation of me. You'd be surprised how people cool off when you call them on the phone and go, "Yeah, I'm the blah blah blah, 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 blah asshole." Blah, blah. Um, but now, because of the volume of emails available, and because people uh, they drum up, uh, you know, armies of offended people. It happened last fall. On a scale, it was probably the worst thing times a hundred that we've ever gone through, because it got out. Um, uh, on the national, uh, I call it hate radio, the right-wing hate radio networks. And we were just like their devil du jour, you know. So they just put the word out, you know, 
to the winged monkeys, you know, descend on these people. Here are their email addresses, and my publisher, my editor, and me, they just shut us down for like 30 hours um, by filling up our email boxes and our phone boxes and everything, just livid, screaming at us for being racist. This is an institution that's been the most progressive institution in central Kentucky for 40 years. The publisher is black. Mm -hmm. My boss is black. You know, I mean, to call us racist is just crazy. And the governor of Kentucky is the guy who did it. And so then, the, yeah, he called us racist. Uh, and uh, so when it got out on, on right-wing radio, then we were just besieged. And you can't answer all those people. There are too many of them. These aren't our readers. You know, these are just people that were in other states that have been, uh, you know, sort of flash mobbed by their local, you know, right wing uh, hate radio DJ. Um, but still, when I, if I get a letter or a phone call from somebody who's an offended reader, I try to answer with a letter or a phone call or an email when I can. It's not as easy as it used to be. And most people, they don't have my platform. You know, there's a lot of angry people out there about a lot of different stuff, and I'm, it's a real privilege to have the, uh, you know, the soapbox, so it's not that hard to answer a few letters every once in a while, and the, the way to disarm them is agree with them. I don't pick fights with them. Somebody says, you know, you're the worst artist, and you got the tiniest little walnut brain ever. I can't believe you even have any job, much less this job, and I just write them back, and I'll go, well, you know. I'm starting to believe that because uh, that's not the first time I've heard it. Um, I guess I better be good around here so I don't lose it because you're right, I'd probably never get another, just something, you know. Most people just want to be heard. I was um, wondering um, when I started uh, looking into all your activist work, you're on the board of a couple of different things. One is the um, uh, Political Cartoonist Rights International. Could you talk about how you... Uh, started working for that organization and what some of the stuff that you were doing with it? Yeah, first of all, I got to admit, I'm not super active about it. I am the president of the board of directors, but I sort of lend my name and, uh, you know, sign things and make calls and write letters when I'm instructed to by our by the guy who does the, the, the volunteers who do the real work. Um, Cartoonist Rights Network International, CRNI, looks out for the rights of cartoonists in other countries where... This, I mean, the worst thing that can happen to you here is you get fired. You can still draw stuff and put it on the internet, but around the world, it's a different matter. An awful lot of regimes of different stripes do not really appreciate, shall we say, satire, much less criticism, much less ridicule. And they crack down on people. And when they do, we do what we can to publicize their plight. I mean, we don't have any magic, uh, you know, levers to pull. We write letters. We uh, try to shame, uh, you know, governments into uh, doing the right thing. On rare occasions, we have helped relocate people, but that is fraught with danger. You know, they crack on their families, uh, you know, the same as any kind of political refugee. So, uh, you know, people in this country, <laughs> we really need to to uh, treasure the uh, the freedoms that we have because you can't take them for granted. That's why you have to push the envelope. I know, you do have to. Is there um, any um, current people that we should be aware of that isn't getting any kind of national or international attention? Well, the one that's uh, bothering me a lot right now, there are always a half a dozen or so, and if you go to our website at crni.com, uh, you can find them, is a young woman named uh, Atina, I think it's Farganzani, I sometimes mispronounce it. She was uh, thrown in jail in December in Iran for simply drawing uh, the Iranian parliament as farm animals. They weren't even pooping or farting. <laughs> they were just farm animals. And that is so, like, run-of-the-mill uh, in this country to, like, you know, uh, uh, draw somebody as some kind of animal. I mean, it's just nobody would ever think about you know, cracking down on you for it. It's just nothing. And this young woman, she's in her 20s, is in prison in Iran for it. And uh, it's a helpless feeling to know that and not be able to do much. I and, mean, you know, we write letters, we contact the embassy, you know, we try to get people interested, uh, you know, try to drum up a, um, um, a critical mass of opposition to where, you know, the easiest thing to do is let them out. 
you know, when the Iranians let that Washington Post reporter go a month or so ago, we thought maybe that was a, a window of opportunity for Atina, but it didn't happen. So we'll keep trying. Mm-hmm.